All right, good afternoon. Um, after we're done here, uh, Brendan Varma will have the pleasure of taking your questions. Um, I just want to start off with an issue I know that's all important uh, to all of you on uh, press freedom. Uh, and I have been asked about the Secretary General's response to a recent letter sent to him by the Committee to Protect Journalists concerning recent restrictions on press as well as the deaths of journalists while in detention. It is clear that during the period of COVID-19 pandemic, the Secretary General has been concerned about the number of restrictions and attacks against journalists who are just doing their job. Many have been subject to harassment, acts of intimidation, sanctions, killings, and also arbitrary detention. We know that prisoners, detainees, and those deprived of their liberty in general are highly vulnerable to the rapid spread of the coronavirus. The Secretary General calls on governments to immediately release, to immediately release, uh, excuse me, the Secretary General calls on governments to immediately release journalists who have been detained for exercising their profession. It is the Secretary General's firm belief that a free press is essential for peace, justice, sustainable development, and human rights. No democracy can function without press freedom, which is the cornerstone of trust between people and their institutions. When media workers are targeted, societies as a whole pay a price. You will recall that we issued a statement last week that the Secretary General is appalled by the continued and increased numbers of attacks against journalists and media workers around the world. Thank you. Um, so going on to this earlier today, the Secretary General spoke at the high-level ministerial meeting on Yemen with the coronavirus pandemic, the urgency of reaching a negotiated political settlement to end the conflict has only grown. He added that we are more than two, there are more than 2,000 confirms of COVID-19 in Yemen, but experts estimate that there are possibly up to 1 million people impacted by the virus with a fatality rates of up to 30%. The Secretary General urged all parties to cease hostilities. He said he was deeply concerned about the status of the safer oil tanker moored off the western coast of Yemen. An oil spill, an explosion, a fire would have catastrophic humanitarian and environmental consequences for Yemen and the entire region, he warned. The Secretary General added that to date, only 30% of the UN response plan is funded, the lowest level ever this late in the year. Fulfilling all pledges to date and increasing them wherever possible is vital to preventing a devastating famine. And earlier today, the Secretary General also spoke in person at the traditional peace bell ceremony on the 39th anniversary of International Peace Day. He said that peace is never a given. It is an inspiration, excuse me, it is an aspiration that is only as strong as our conviction and only as durable as our hope. The Secretary General noted that today the COVID-19 pandemic is expanding risks to peace everywhere, stressing we need to silence the guns and focus on our common enemy, the virus. Following that, the Secretary General spoke to a virtual student observance of the International Day of Peace. He told them that he is always inspired at how much meaningful action young peace builders, peace builders take every day to make our world a better place. He now stressed that we need to, them to inspire combatants to engage in battle, to stand down and think of their common good. We shared both sets of remarks with you earlier. And in the Security Council this morning, the Executive Secretary of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, Ibrahim Chaw, briefed Council members on the humanitarian effects of environmental degradation. He said that a large number of threats to international peace and security today are linked to the environment. He stressed that conflicts over access to natural resources are not new, but he said the intensity and frequency are unprecedented. And. Um, just a reminder that yesterday the emergency relief coordinator, Mark Lowcock, told council members about the uh, grave humanitarian situation in Syria. He highlighted the impact on the humanitarian situation of the economic downturn, noting that the price of standard food basket has increased by 250 percent since last year. On humanitarian access, he highlighted that the UN is adjusting to its cross-border operations in the Northwest to meet the needs of millions who rely on these operations for life-saving uh, goods. 
And our colleagues in the UN Development Coordination Office tell us that Arnaud Peral of France has taken up his new post as the resident coordinator in Tunisia this week. His appointment follows confirmation by the host government. He and 128 other resident coordinators are boosting coordination among UN entities to support national and local efforts to address and recover better from COVID-19 and achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. And we have remained at full gender parity in our resident coordinators. And just to highlight the situation in Sudan, where the World Food Program says it's scaling up its efforts to reach nearly 160,000 people impacted by devastating floods, the worst the country has seen in a century. Some 650,000 people are believed to have been impacted by the flood so far. WFP says it's working tirelessly with the government of Sudan and our partners to ensure that food reaches those who need it and to increase the number of people who receive aid. And I want to thank uh, our friends in the Democratic Republic of the Congo who have paid up their regular budget dues in full, bringing us up to 116. Um, and as you heard the Deputy Secretary General Richard Curtis, I want to remind you that um, the SDG Moment event with leaders and stakeholders convened by the Secretary General will take place uh, tomorrow, and that will be uh, visible on the web. And the SDG Broadcast Moment, the film that Richard was mentioning, will air Saturday at 9 a.m. on the UN's YouTube channels, Facebook, Twitter, and Web TV, and also on a number of other partner broadcasters. Okay, uh, let me go to your questions. Uh, while I log on, let me turn to uh, Mr. Sato. Thank you, Stefan. So, uh, let me clarify, the, uh, if I missed the, your, some of the word at the opening statement, did you say the, uh, the one, had me, one million possible case in Yemen, according no, uh, to the export? You would think that I actually listened to what I actually say. So let me go back and make sure I said the right thing. Um, I know I said the right thing as long as I'm... Um, what I said, there are 2,000 confirmed cases, but experts estimate there are possibly up to 1 million of people affected by the virus with a fatality rate of as 30%. So that's an estimate. Can you elaborate uh, what what export are they or from and the let WHO? Me get, let me get a bit more information on that because Thank that you. is a very valid question. Uh, okay, uh, Alan, uh, Ria Novosti, go ahead. Alan? Thank you, Stefan. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, uh, Stefan, uh, I have a question regarding Nobel Prizes. Uh, and maybe you, you have heard that uh, former Prime Minister of Poland, uh, Donald Tusk, uh, has proposed to nominate uh, the Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tikhanovska for Nobel Peace Prize. And also, I've heard some reports that uh, uh, Alexei Navalny uh, is also proposed, uh, is advised to be proposed uh, for this uh, Nobel Prize, Peace Prize. Uh, have you, do you have any vision, any comment regarding I, these candidates? Do, do you think it's, uh, does it no, make it's, sense? It's not, uh, first of all, the, the Nobel Peace Prize is not ours to give. Uh, so it is not for us to comment on reports of who may, who may be or not be uh, nominated. It doesn't involve the UN in any way. Uh, as we usually do, we will obviously congratulate uh, the person, the entity, or whoever uh, wins the prize. Um, and I do congratulate you on the artwork behind you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah, it's very nice. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't have any more. Uh, Stefano Vaccara. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, is about the, um, the investigation on the death of uh, Mario Paciola in uh, Colombia. Do you have uh, any uh, information about the... Um, there are journalists in Colombia that they say that they waiting practically for uh, the recall of certain uh, officer, UN officer from Colombia because uh, for the way they handle the 
the situation. So do you have a, can you confirm or not no, that no, uh, even uh, at the top no, level I, of the mission uh, that we, there are, seen, there are going to be? We've seen, all, we've seen all sorts of press reports. Uh, those are, you're always, press reports are always interesting. We're reading them, uh, but we are not going to comment in any way on, uh, on speculation. We are focusing on supporting the investigations being done by the Colombian authorities and by the Italian authorities. Uh, you're you are saying that these are uh, not truth or there is no, something I'm not saying, that maybe- I'm not, saying that I'm not commenting one way or another on those reports. Um, Abdel Hamid and then James Bayes. Sorry, I, uh, I don't have a question. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, you, I'm having trouble with the chat. Uh, James Bayes, I'm, no doubt you have a question. I do have a question, Steph. So following up from the Secretary General's non-answer on snapback yesterday, where he referred us to the UN Security Council to come up with a position, clearly the UN is not just in an ivory tower on First Avenue. It's an operational organization. You have people going about their business all around the world, and they one assumes, have to obey international sanctions. So from Sunday, what is the UN's position? Will it be obeying all the sanctions that are on Iran that are back in place, or will it not be obeying them because nothing will have changed? We may have something to say publicly on Sunday, uh, but at this point, uh, I'm not going to go any further or in a different direction than what the Secretary General said yesterday. But nothing actually changes between now and Sunday, either the, other than the fact that they either come back in force or they don't. But it, you, you should be able to determine a position now, just as you should on, can on Sunday, surely. Well, uh, surely we will uh, wait till, uh, till Sunday uh, to say anything further if we can. I look forward to taking your call I on have Sunday, a James. Now. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Abdel Hamid. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, uh, probably you heard, Stefan, that uh, Faiz Sarraj of uh, the national, uh, Libyan National Accord government uh, is thinking of resigning by the end of uh, October in order to bring the Libyan parties together and to allow this information of an executive body to appoint whoever they think and bring the Libyan parties together. Do you have a comment to that? Sure. We've seen, you know, we've seen the comments made by uh, Mr. Siraj, I think, uh, earlier uh, today and the various reports earlier in the week. For our part, uh, we, uh, UNSMIL, the mission on the ground, uh, led by Stephanie Williams, is continuing its in intensive, res res excuse me, its in intensive ref efforts to resume uh, fully inclusive intra-Libyan uh, intra uh, political dialogue. I think we need to build on the recent meetings and the recent uh, statements made by Mr. Siraj, as well as by Gila Saleh, the head of the House of Representatives uh, late uh, in August. And I think while we move on facilitating the intra-political dialogue on Libya, what is just as critical is for the international community uh, to fulfill its responsibilities in terms of respecting the sovereignty of Libya, to cease interference in Libya's internal affairs, and as we have been uh, saying very clearly for some time, respect the UN arms embargo that was imposed by the Security Council itself. Okay, I'm having trouble with my chat function. If, all right, I'll take a question there, or otherwise just wave if you have a question on video. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Stefan. My name is Ray Bouchafar. I'm with the Sky News Arabia. Uh, yesterday, the president of the European Union Commission, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, said, and I quote, Turkey has no excuse to intimidate neighbors and warn the Turkey for the military maneuvers in the uh, East Mediterranean. Uh, you have any comment regarding these maneuvers and uh, intimidations? And also, if you allow me, uh, second questions. Uh, the Security Council had urged the Secretary General uh, to appoint a special envoy in Libya. Uh, any ideas when this is going to happen? 
Uh, on your final. second question, uh, we, we understand the, the urging of the Security Council. We want to appoint a, um, a uh, special envoy on Libya through the, the, new, uh, the new format. Uh, I would add that while that process is ongoing, uh, Stephanie Williams is uh, f leading the mission in Libya with the Secretary General's full uh, support. That process is ongoing. The Secretary General has said he would, uh, he is working very hard and very quickly on that. But that will obviously also involve uh, Security Council and the members of the Security Council to reach uh, an agreement. On your first question, um, I would just reiterate what we've already said, which we, uh, you know, the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean is one of concern uh, to us. We very much hope that the parties will settle these issues through dialogue. We understand there have been uh, direct discussions, uh, I think, under the auspices of NATO, if I'm not mistaken, between the Greeks and the Turkish authorities, and we hope that discussions uh, will bear fruit. Okay, uh, if anybody on the screen has a question, open your mic or wave. Excellent. I question, Stefan. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, just a question on, uh, you mentioned you were talking about press freedoms, uh, a different part of the press. Uh, what's the latest with the inner city press? They've apparently asked to be credentialed, and that's been ignored. Um, they played an active part in uncovering UN corruption over the years. Where, where, does, where, does, where do they stand regarding a UN credentialing? Mr. Lee's status uh, remains unchanged. Okay. Uh, and, uh, does, sorry. and does that mean that does that mean that that's going to stay unchanged, meaning he's banned for the next for this general assembly? Well, I mean, there's no, you know we're not issuing any uh, new credentials for this general assembly because there's really nothing. Uh, there are no physical, barely any physical events here. So there's no, no temporary credentials uh, are being given anyway. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I will leave you in the capable hands of Mr. Varma, and I will see you uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be doing the briefings from an undisclosed location. At least I will. Um, Brendan will be here. On Monday we will be here in this room. And on Tuesday, we will not brief. On Wednesday, we will likely not brief as well, given all the speeches going on in the GA. We should resume Thursday uh, briefing here uh, in person through the hybrid system. Brendan, hopefully you can smell the sulfur on the podium. <laughs>